Hey everybody, it's Zach here from the Schmidt Music Saxophone Shop. Today I'm joined with Ryan Richmond. He's the Vice President uh, of Eastman Music Company. He's also uh, kind of the brains behind the design of their Eastman saxophone. So we're really excited to have you here today. Um, and I'm, yeah. Thank you, Zach. Um, I don't know if I'd call me the brains behind it, though. That's, that's, oh, okay. that's, that's a lot. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have a great team. Um, and our saxophones, um, our saxophone product line is kind of lucky because we do have a lot of people at Eastman that love the saxophone and play the saxophone. Um, our vice president of operations, uh, Ralph Torres, is a very fine saxophone player, and uh, I would say he is equally responsible for uh, the success of our, of our saxophones, uh, as I am, and David Chapani at the Haynes Company. I mean, we'll probably talk about him when we're talking about the DS mechanism mm -hmm. named for David Chapani, mm -hmm. um, his, his ideas and what he came up with as far as uh, the mechanism on our 800 series saxophones. And we also have Roger Greenberg on our saxophone team. And Roger, um, you know, if you've, if you've been in the saxophone world uh, on the classical side, or the academic side at all, uh, you'll know the name Roger Greenberg. Um, he's, he's just been at it for, for his lifetime. Uh, taught at UNC for many years, played in the LA Saxophone Quartet, played in the Harvey Patel Saxophone Quartet, studied with Joe Allard. Mm -hmm. um, just a wonderful human being and a fabulous saxophone player. So we're, we're really blessed, actually, with uh, a great talent of saxophonists. Yeah. At and it's, it is absolutely a collective effort of what we do. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, maybe first we can kind of get into, you know, how did you get into Eastman sure. in the first place? And what were you doing prior to that that got you interested in saxophone design? And how did this all kind of... How did it all start? Come together, yeah. Well, I've been at Eastman now for 12 years. Um, this fall will be my, my 12th anniversary. And before that, I worked in music retail. I, I worked at a music store in Utah. Uh, I spent 12 years at, at the store that I was at prior to Eastman, um, and I did every job there. I was on the road. I managed the store. I managed the repair shop. Um, I was a buyer for the store. Uh, I was kind of like the, the general manager mm -hmm. of this music store. Um, so I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and before that, I in high school and, and college, I worked uh, at various things. I taught private lessons. Um, my wife is a band director, so we were, uh, you know, we're very focused on that. Uh, I was going to be a music educator, mm -hmm. um, but decided that uh, when she got finished her degree and started teaching, and I was uh, well on my way in uh, music industry, that this was my path more than yeah. more more than being a, a music educator. Yeah. Uh, and then before that, I think the, the it, it all started probably when I was young and taking lessons. Uh, so I was a woodwind. Um, player. I studied uh, all of the woodwinds. I've taken lessons on, on all of them. Um, and as a teenager, my teacher, my main teacher, um, was a repair technician. And in school, I played things like bass clarinet and bassoon and baritone saxophone and all the horns that don't work right. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, that, was, that was my upbringing is, is playing these school-owned instruments that never actually worked right. And uh, when I started studying with Richard, my teacher, if a horn didn't work, we went from the studio to the bench and we made the horn work um, more than once. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with my teacher, I rebuilt a bass clarinet and I rebuilt a baritone saxophone all, you know, in my, in my early years. Yeah. So that I could perform on them, play on them. So that's kind of where it started, and that just kind of kept with me, and I cultivated that in my experience in the music industry. I, I took a job with Eastman as a regional sales manager, actually. Um, that was my first assignment with Eastman, and Schmidt Music was one of my accounts. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been associated with the store for, for that whole time uh, at Eastman. And I just kind of grew into that position of sales, and one day, uh, my manager asked if I would be, have any interest in doing product management. And I said, sure, because I'm, I'm an agreeable kind of person. I want to please people. So mm -hmm. I said, absolutely, I will take on this assignment, this task. What that meant was, 
Um, of course, this was when Eastman was very early on in making band instruments. We started as a string company mm -hmm. and became very dominant in uh, the orchestral part of the music industry. Um, but the band instruments were very new and they weren't very good. And so becoming the product manager for band instruments meant I got, I was the complaint department, yeah. right? Everyone would come to me and say, I want it this way. This is wrong. This is wrong. And I would take notes. I would take notes on what we needed to do to improve those products and improve those instruments. And so that's really what most of my uh, job at Eastman has been is, is listening to our customers, taking their feedback and making a better band instrument. Uh, it started with all the brass instruments. And then as we've grown, um, we've hired people to fully manage those departments. And it's allowed me to spend a lot more time on sex plays, which is really great. Um, so that's kind of how it all started, it was just as a kid. I was very intrigued on how they worked and my teacher was being a repair technician and, um, and learning that along the way. So that's kind of my, my story through my musical career. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I know your instruments over the years have gone through a lot of different iterations and designs. And maybe I'm just gonna jump topics here. Sure. Um, because at some point, your saxophones were being made in Taiwan. Correct. And you, you know, in the grand scheme, recently have started making your saxophones in-house. Yeah. How, how was that transition from having someone else making your products and doing the design work? How did that change to when you started making your instruments kind of sure. round up? Well... We went to Taiwan um, to start uh, selling saxophones uh, because that was common practice, and mm -hmm. it still is. Mm -hmm. um, Taiwan uh, has a large footprint in sax saxophone manufacturing. Yeah, and some of the some of the best saxophones out there are coming from Taiwan. They, they make a lot of saxophones, mm -hmm. um, and there's name brands from Taiwan. Um, and most people don't realize the Taiwanese have been making saxophones, um, I, I believe, longer than the Japanese have, mm -hmm. um, by about 20 years, actually. So they've been doing it a long time uh, in that country. And there is a little industry of saxophone makers there. Uh, when talking to Roger, Roger has experience with this before coming to work for Eastman. And he told me that, you know, you can name 30 different factories in Taiwan that make saxophones or parts for saxophones. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a great deal of manufacturing there. And other brand names have gone to Taiwan and have subcontracted saxophone making for them. Uh, famous brands. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of saxophones coming out of Taiwan with various brand names. So when we wanted to get into the saxophone business as a violin company and as a company that owned the Haynes Flute shop in uh, Acton, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and we were really working on our brass instruments at the time with two facilities uh, in China near our violin uh, making facility. Uh, we wanted to get into saxophones, but we didn't make saxophones. You know, and saxophone is different from a flute. It's different from a violin. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it requires different skill sets and whatnot. So we did what other makers did, what other manufacturers did. We went to Taiwan and we uh, had an OEM saxophone produced for us. And it's an interesting thing. You go, uh, there's various companies that you can deal with and you can go and you can basically pick out what you want. Mm -hmm. And so the 52nd Street was an idea of a saxophone that uh, Eastman had. And uh, we went to Taiwan to procure that idea. Mm -hmm. And so we play tested many things and decided this was the 52nd Street. Um, and worked for that supplier, and they're wonderful people, and they make you know a very good product. Um, but Eastman has always wanted to make everything that we sell. It's 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 been important to us from the very beginning. Uh, when starting into saxophones, we knew that that wouldn't be probably the forever solution. Yeah. Um, but it was a way for us to study the saxophone market and sell saxophones and and be part of that community uh, where before we just weren't. Um, mm -hmm. So we did that for many years. Uh, we attracted a little bit of attention with the, the, the thought of a 52nd Street, the idea of that, mm -hmm. that tonality, that sound quality. Yeah. Um, and as it grew, we just knew that it was time to start building saxophones in our own house. 
And so that's when we started to make the transition to building our own saxophones. Yeah. And did you have, uh, I mean, you had a design for the 52nd Street in mind. I know you have various levels of instruments and now you're making student instruments all the way up to pro line. Mm -hmm. I know we were talking about this earlier this morning, but kind of what is your process when you're coming up with the design for new saxophones? Where do you, where do you start? Sure. And how do you get to something like your new, you know, B flat berry student instrument? Sure. Well, each instrument, um, you know, right now, alto, uh, alto tenor and baritone uh, that we make in our, in our facility in China starts with an acoustic design. So, or a scale, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you talk to flute players, they'll say this one has a Cooper scale or this one has a, this scale or that scale or whatnot. And so we wanted to start with, a, with an acoustic design, a scale. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have our alto scale, we have our tenor scale, we have our baritone scale. And those are the same uh, geometry that we use for all of our altos, mm -hmm. right? So we started out designing a professional alto saxophone. Yeah. And then we use that tooling, that geometry, to make uh, step up or performance level products and ultimately student level products. Mm -hmm. And the difference between a professional instrument and a student instrument is not necessarily in the size of the tone hole or the, the taper of the bore, or it's not really there. It's in how you process the metal. Mm -hmm. It's in how, especially in a brass instrument. You know, yeah. We can talk about other types of musical instruments and what makes the difference between a very high end instrument and a, and a student model. And, you know, previously, uh, before the technology that we all possess, student models in the band instrument were basically outdated professional models. Mm -hmm. Like people just, the, the, the people that came before me made very high quality products. And as they evolved and developed and created newer products or better products, that tooling is still good. Mm -hmm. So they used to make less expensive products. But um, when I've been talking about kind of the evolution of instrument development, uh, I would say something like in the, in the past, um, student instruments were incredibly well made, beautifully made, high mm -hmm. craftsmanship with very poor design. Yeah. Because it was an outdated design. Yeah. Right. And today, with all the technology that we have, student instruments are incredibly well designed mm -hmm. and incredibly poorly built. Yeah. Uh, because the execution of that design just isn't good. So, you know, what I'm trying to do is create from professional all the way down to student with beautifully made instruments that are also well designed. Mm -hmm. um, so we use the same acoustic design for all of our altos. On our tenors, they're all the same. Yeah. The baritones are all the same. Um, and it's just the way we process the metal, um, how you treat the metal, how you connect the seam, how, you yeah. know, the, the processes that that body uh, goes through, the lightness of the keys, the quality of the pads, the quality of the springs. Mm -hmm. um, all of that makes a difference. And that's what makes a difference between a student model and a, and a professional model is that attention to detail, but more than that, it's how you process that what you do to that metal to draw out the resonance. Yeah. Do you think, uh, do you think having the same design in Eastman, student saxophones, I know it's not the same exact design, but it's, it's similar top to bottom, the mm -hmm. tone holes and everything, the keyword. The geometry is the same. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Do you think that makes the transition into like that next step up Eastman instrument easier? Cause it feels similar. Probably. You know, if you are comfortable with the way an instrument tunes as yeah. you want more resonance and uh, more responsiveness and more core in that sound, yeah, you're mm -hmm. going to feel more comfortable because um, it will be very familiar. Yeah, I've, I've found with a couple of brands, they'll come in with their student instrument and I always want to hear kids on their student instrument before we start looking at that next step. And you do find with some brands, they get on that next level within the brand and they're like, this feels really comfortable. Yeah. It's because it's the same brand. Yeah. The key work feels really similar sure. and the intonation and how it flows feels pretty similar. It's just, you know, that next quality up and how right. that instrument was put together. And yeah. we talked about too, kind of the, the craftsmanship that goes into your top of the line and how much you spend, you know, really fine tuning um, the stuff 
sure. at the top. Yeah, when you're talking about a high-end setup, um, and this is something that's super important to me because I think a lot of modern instruments are not really set up very well. Uh, and so we make so much effort uh, is put towards uh, the finishing of our products. We buy very high-end pads. We make our own resonators. Um, I, I think we might be the only manufacturer that has a screw-back resonator on our high-end model, on our mm -hmm. function model. I don't know if another maker does that. Um, so we, we use our own resonator that's a domed brass resonator on our 800 series. Um, we use the highest-end Paisoni pad. Um, we use really high-end uh, silencing materials, uh, the tech quartz and the felts and the you know, it's all um, modern and, mm -hmm. and quick and quiet. And so we, we go that extra level in our setup, um, uh, even down to the shape of our key cups. Like we do so much to emulate great horns of the past and have a beautiful setup on these instruments. So that makes a big difference. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the student models shouldn't play well and it mm -hmm. shouldn't seal. So we use a good quality Italian pad on our student models, just not the most expensive one, yeah. right? We use high quality corks. We just don't use the most advanced synthetic type yeah. materials on the, on the student one. So even though the geometry is the same, you know, the finished product is made to hit a price point. It's made yeah. to be more affordable, more accessible, but it still means, it, it still doesn't mean that we don't want to have a good scale yeah. and that we don't want it to be yeah. comfortable. It has to be all those things. And I'm sure you guys are doing this too, where, you know, you're thinking of longevity of saxophones and instruments in a whole, and sure. you're probably bringing up, you know, young people into the craft too, and like having them help help get those student instruments going out the door. It's like great experience for people who will eventually, hopefully, be working on your top of the line saxophones. Sure, you know? absolutely. Yeah, everything's you know, our workshops. Uh, we have people that've been with us for a long time, mm -hmm. and they grow in experience. And uh, so, yeah, everyone has an opportunity to advance. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, well, something that's kind of new and exciting in the saxophone world is the new 52nd Street tenor saxophone that just launched the yeah. 852. Um, the standard 52nd Street has been around. Well, since you guys have been making it in-house, mm -hmm. how long has that been around? Uh, it's been, well, let's see, I always lose track of time of the pandemic. Um, because that, that gap, you know, uh -huh. I want to say it's been like five years, um, yeah. but it's probably been more like six or and, seven. And then yeah. before that, how long were they being made in the Taiwan? We started in 2010. Okay. Yeah. So or probably six, about seven years or so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, what is, what is new in the 852 yeah. compared to... The standard 652. 52 that you have been. And I know you probably have some trade secrets and you can't get into specific numbers and stuff like that. Yeah. But I'm curious, like, what is the difference in, in those two models? Sure. Well, um, when I think of our 600 series saxophones versus our 800 series saxophones, mm -hmm. and this is kind of true both for the Rue St. George, mm -hmm. the model 650 and 850, as well as the 52nd Street, um, I think of... A, one huge difference is keyword, mm -hmm. right? So you can't really talk about the 800 series saxophone without talking about keyword, because mm -hmm. that's what sets it apart. That's the biggest one thing yeah. that sets it apart from, from the 600 series. The 600 series has a very nice uh, keyboard. It's, it's, it's familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Like it feels like a saxophone. It feels really comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, the 800 series keywork uh, or the DS mechanism, named yeah. for David Schiavone, is a mechanism that David uh, developed uh, at the Haynes Company. And David is a flute builder. Um, he's been doing this maybe almost 40 years probably, where yeah. he's been making high-end custom flutes uh, in the Boston area. And he's a saxophonist. And so the idea of having David create something new for saxophone was really appealing to us. It's something we wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and we said, David, just just create, just do something yeah. that you want to do. Uh, we didn't give him any instructions. We didn't say we wanted it to feel this way. We didn't say it has to be this or be that. We just said, here's a saxophone with a whole bunch of parts. Yeah. Make a make a saxophone. Well, the yeah. saxophone has, you know, enough issues to begin with. with Does. Intonation and sure. the keyword design has just, they're, they're almost 
isn't a standard yet to this point because it just it always is changing. Well, I think the saxophone, well, every musical instrument has an evolution. Yeah. Right? Every, everything kind of develops and grows. Yeah. Um, the saxophone is unique uh, in the world of, of wind instruments because, I, I, you know, to me, it's the only one that was invented rather than evolving out of something more primitive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the newest member of the family. Um, and when you look at an instrument made by Mr. Sax versus an instrument made today, the average person might not even notice the difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were really, it hasn't changed as much as other things. Um, but when it comes to um, the quality of the mechanism uh, or the, the quietness, the speed, mm -hmm. the stability, you know, those types of things, um, it's kind of been the same for a long time. You know, I think the modern saxophone really dates back to the 40s. I think that that when, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that era of saxophone making kind of set the standard for us. And a lot of our instruments are just, you know, uh, evolved from that, that origin. Um, it's the first time, you know, uh, that we have the balanced action. Yeah. Where the right hand is offset from the left hand, right? And it's more comfortable to play. Mm -hmm and modern key shapes start to take form. And today, saxophones are just you know, versions of that a little bit, um, as far as the mechanism and the layout. Um, so the, the mechanism is the big difference. And yeah. what David did was he took uh, cues from fine flute making, yeah. uh, where the back feet are super stable. And that's really the, the mechanism uh, part that that's the most important. So yeah. like the key shapes and everything, that's sculpture, that's art, that's beautiful, yeah. feels great under the hand, but the- and That's what most people notice that's right most, away that's when right. they take like, it out. This feels like, so great. The silver touches are, they're kind of nice. And the, right. the bump on that low B, right. or low C sharp to right. low B feels, feels pretty really good, nice, right? you know? Yeah. But that, there's so much more going well, on that's the, not just- the, the, big yeah. thing, the big thing is the back feet, right? And so you probably can't see, but the feet on the back of the neck of the stacks. So the yeah. feet back here on the lower stack. And of course, you know, the feet here on the back of the upper stack. Yeah. And that's the, that's the part that's patented. Yeah. Right. So that's the part of the instrument that we actually hold a patent on. And that, that gives you this stability that the, the horn doesn't come out of adjustment as regularly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this horn doesn't have any adjustment screws on it. So you have to have a really, really fine setup. Um, yeah. And that all contributes to this horn's, um, playability and feel and um, so I, I just I love the back feet you know that that's that's the nuts and bolts of the of the mechanism the yeah. DS mechanism but but in addition to making fine flutes and now saxophones uh, mm -hmm. David is also an artist um, he makes beautiful drawings of mechanism like we have it on the Haynes website you can go to the Shapani drawings and you can see his pencil sketches yeah. of different keys on instruments. Maybe we can um, find that link. And yeah, we'll, it's, we'll put it, it below. Okay, so yeah. it's, it's uh, you can see his sketches and also his sculpture. So David started out as a jeweler and you know he made jewelry and so the, the key shapes were all hand done by David. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of people feel. So it is that too, but the feel of, of the basic um, keyboard here is all because of that uh, back feet design, yeah. which, you know, he borrowed from making really high end flutes. Yeah. Uh, but it works on the saxophone uh, yeah. and it works really well. So that, that, you know, when you're talking about the difference between six and eight in our lineup, that's the biggest difference. Yeah. Um, the, the other differences are, um, you know, on our, on our New St. George series, you're going to see more elaborate engraving um, on the 52nd street what you're going to see is some changes in the tone holes. So uh, 52nd Street has rolled tone holes or rolled style tone holes, yeah. I should say. Um, and on the 800 series, we stopped in the center of the horn. Mm -hmm. So the upper half of the instrument doesn't have rolled tone holes. The bottom half does. Yeah. And uh, we found that we really loved the way that the extra mass on the bottom of the saxophone yeah. gave us this huge bottom end, this really big, fat yeah. sounding uh, lower end of the horn. And the removal of that mass, uh, the upper mm -hmm. end of the horn, gave us a really singing altissimo, yeah. uh, really responsive altissimo. So kind of 
cutting it in the middle yeah. and, and keeping some of the flavor of that original 52nd Street for the bottom, but changing a little bit the top yeah. to make it a little bit more responsive. And, you know, we're talking about players, you know, who are playing vintage horns, going to modern horns. Yeah. Um, and, and how some, some of those players feel like they're kind of missing out in that variety of tone that their vintage horns have. Right. And I think, like, that design is a, is a nice way for, like, the low end sounds and feels one way. And as you transition up the horn, it starts to, you know, kind of open up and get a little bit more sure. colorful because there's, there's a lot of really great modern horns out there that the tone is, is pretty darn even from the bottom to the top of the horn. And for some type, for some type of music, that's really nice for, for like the jazz rock and pop player. Mm -hmm. um, I think having that variety of tone is, mm. is, is nice. Um, I think yeah. that's a good way to like bridge that gap between those people who are playing on vintage horns that kind of want to stay in that sound, but they want an instrument that just that just works better. Sure. That's a little bit more in tune. That that key work feels a little bit more natural. Sure. Um, so there's obviously a great market for for people who are looking for horns like that, and yeah. and it seems to fit the bill yeah. pretty well. Um, I know that uh, Bob Mincer was was someone that you had in mind when you were designing that saxophone because I yep. know he played on one of your early Taiwanese horns for a long time and yep. he really liked that. And when you guys switched over to making your own saxophones in Beijing, uh, I know you guys, I think you had given him one of your new ones and he was like, I still like my old one a yep. little bit more. What kind of role did he play in helping you design these saxophones or play test them? Or how did that relationship go? Because yeah. if you don't know, the new 52nd Street tenors come with two necks, yeah. the standard neck that the 52s have always come with, and it comes with a Bob Mincer neck yeah. as well. So yeah. how did that all happen sure. with Bob? Well, Bob was, uh, you know, we, we met Bob early on in making saxophones and it was because of his position at USC. Um, Ralph uh, and Roger took some saxophones to uh, just get Bob's feedback. Like, mm -hmm. Tell us, do you like these? Yeah. Uh, you know, how are we doing? Are these good saxophones? Yeah. And, you know, Bob tells the story really well. He's like, the first time I kind of blew him off, uh, and he did. Like, they had to go, you know, he was like, ah. The second time, he, they met with him at his home. And, and Ralph and Roger took these uh, saxophones, and he actually liked the soprano a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he said it was way more in tune, way more comfortable. He liked a lot. That's what Bob originally uh, signed on to endorse for Eastman was our soprano saxophone. Okay. Uh, and not the 52nd Street, just the standard uh, 642 model mm -hmm. uh, soprano saxophone. And I think he still plays that one, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but he doesn't play a lot of soprano. Uh, most of his, his work that you know we see is tenor. Um, and he didn't start playing the tenor right away. And so if you really look back in Eastman history and you look at the first ads, you'll see Bob playing the soprano, not the tenor. Mm -hmm. uh, because we weren't going to, we didn't want to make any false statements or anything like that. You know, Bob endorsed the, the soprano. He played the soprano. And he also said that uh, if somebody's looking for a new horn, I recommend Eastman the most. Like that was, that was the, yeah. that was the endorsement. Yep. He continued to play on his vintage instrument. Yeah. Um, and then the Yellow Jackets had a Japanese tour. And at the time, there was a lot of, um, you know, conversation about uh, the airlines not treating musical instruments very nicely. And Bob didn't want to travel to Japan on this long tour with his vintage yeah. instrument. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to just take the Eastman. Yeah. Um, so he took the Eastman, and while on the tour, he noticed that all the sound guys were saying, hey, this is really a lot easier to mix. This is a lot easier to deal mm. with on the sound side. It sounds better through these microphones, you know, this, that, and the other. And at the end of the tour, Bob said, you know, I think I'm just going to play on this. And so that tour with the Yellow Jackets and Bob not wanting to take his vintage instrument really gave him the opportunity to play the 52nd Street in all of these scenarios. And it turned out it was a really good instrument. And so yeah. he used it, you know, for that for the rest of time until yep. we switched again so he was a very staunch endorser of our product he really did play that instrument that was his main saxophone for those years and when we wanted to build saxophones in our own facility i let all of our artists 
you know, try them and give us feedback and help mm -hmm. develop that product. And when I, you're right, when I first gave the saxophone to Bob, he's like, this is nice, um, but I'm gonna stick with what I have. He's like, but that key work, that key work I love on that Rue St. George, mm -hmm. if you could marry those two, that would be amazing. And yeah. we, we had planned on doing that from the beginning. It's just one step at a time. Yep. Um, and so when it came down to it, and we did marry that key work to a 52nd Street body, I gave Bob the prototype. He's like, well, not yet. You know, it's not quite there yet. So we went back and forth. Um, and this was during the pandemic, mind you. Mm -hmm. There was no traveling to the factory. There was no one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on type of thing. This was Bob saying, it should feel this way, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then me saying, okay, here, make this, do it this way, make it this size, do, and here, Bob, here's a prototype, try it. He's like, it's closer, but I want it to feel like this. Yeah. Um, and so we went back and forth for about three years uh, to finalize this model. Yeah. Um, and so Bob was instrumental, uh, you could say, right, um, in creating this instrument. Yeah. Right? It wouldn't exist without his input and, and, and his feedback. Yeah. Um, and my goal was very simple to not stop until Bob switched. Yeah. Like that was, that was my goal. I wanted to make sure that uh, one of our premier artists was playing on uh, an instrument that people could currently buy. Yeah. Right? That was super important to me because I want to have the people that endorse our product play on an item that other people can purchase. You know? Yeah. Uh, that isn't something that we used to make. Right? Yeah. So that was or like a limited run on an yeah, instrument. Yeah, it, it was super important for me yeah. to make sure that he was playing on our current models. Yep. Um, so I was, you know, we were prepared to, to develop this until he had something we really liked. And it just went back and forth. And, and one of the statements that he made to me um, is, you know, I just want the notes to fall out. I don't want to, you know, I, I just want to play music and not think about the saxophone. It has to be that intuitive, that comfortable, that, you know, it just has to feel that way. Yeah. I, I can't I can't think about the saxophone. I just got to think about the music. So I just want the notes to fall out. And I'm like, all right, well, how do I get the notes just to fall out? Yeah. And so we changed a few things, um, you know, mostly at the top end of the horn and, and at the bottom of the horn to make sure that he had that responsiveness that he was hoping for, that feeling of ease. Um, and so we developed the M neck. So we had an R neck and then an S neck. And it's, People are like, what does that stand for? What do those really mean? And it's pretty simple. The Rue St. George comes with an R neck. The 52nd Street comes with an S neck. Um, and then the M neck is named for Mincer. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it helped him have that openness that he was looking for and that feeling of ease so those notes could just fall out. Yeah. Um, so that's what we developed for, for this saxophone. Yeah, and I know uh, Bob plays on a pretty resistant mouthpiece and reed setup that is not super typical for a lot of people um where in your in your design timeline did you realize that i think we have to change something in the neck uh well i don't know the exact time when we I, you know bob when i first met bob he was playing on a different mouthpiece mm -hmm. but he went back to something that he played for years before so um he plays on a freddie gregory mm -hmm. um and he plays with woodstone reeds um ishimori reeds mm -hmm. yeah yeah um and i you know i don't remember the strength i think they're i don't know three and a half four something like that yeah um and he does have a, a certain amount of resistance in his setup and so we had to i had to change the resistance here Mm -hmm. um, but the funny thing is, is even like somebody who doesn't play on uh, a super hard read setup will enjoy the openness of this one, yeah. right? It's not too open. It's just open. Yeah. It feels, it feels really good to play. So, you know, we were, I, I, uh, we were testing a lot of different things um, and we decided to look at some of Bob's favorite equipment through the years, mm -hmm. right? And measure a lot of different things that he had played on over the years. And we came up with this M neck design and I think it's really lovely. And, it, and, and you know, he loves playing on it. Um, as soon as we, this was like the final touch, so to speak. As soon as we did that, um, he took it on a gig in Las Vegas and wrote me the next Monday and said, 
she's a keeper. Mm -hmm. So that's when we knew the development was done, right? So now he could play on this horn for his living, yeah. and it was a finished product. Mm -hmm. So then we went to market. Um, we went to market, I believe, um, in March. Yeah. That's March. That's awesome. I know the first time we picked up the saxophones and we started with the standard neck on it. And it's like, yeah, it plays really well top to bottom. We put the Mitzer neck on it. It was just like, right. it was like, there is, there is no wall. It's like, if you like, <laughs> if you got a lot of air to blow, it will, you will, you will not hit a wall with it, yeah. which is kind of, which is kind of fun. And it's nice that the horn has two different looks. Um, there's a big selling point with the 850 yeah. uh, series the as necks. well. And just the two necks. And so when people are coming in here, it's really nice to be like, yeah, does it feel like a little bit small? Like, let's try the other neck right. on it then. Um, and that flexibility is really nice. And there's really not any other manufacturers that, you know, the horn has two different looks with it out of the box, which is kind of nice. And sometimes kids come back and they're like, yeah, I play, uh, I play this neck in concert band and then I play the other neck in jazz band with a different mouthpiece. Sure. Um, well, and mouthpiece, you know, I, I mean, it can be very sensitive with mouthpieces, right? So mm -hmm. you have to... Uh, the, and, and a great saxophone player in, Los, in, in uh, Los Angeles once told me, he's like, I think we play more on necks than we play on saxophones. You know, mm -hmm. I think the neck is way more important than we, than we think about. So. Vibrates on every single note. Right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's something that is crucial, right? Uh, mouthpiece, reed, ligature, neck, that top of the horn. Um, it's like head joints in the flute world. Kind of. Yeah. In, in the flute world, they buy, you know, the body of their instrument and the head joint of their instrument separately yeah. and they kind of marry them together and sure. that's not that's not common in the saxophone where it's not done really at all no, no, you know no. you never yeah. out of the box cross brands yeah. and stuff um and i think this is like a, a step i think in the right direction um and yeah I, I i appreciate that um you know the neck is a is a crucial part of the instrument and it's something that we spend a lot of time on uh, not mm -hmm. only in the this this 52nd street but also previous uh the reason that there is an s neck is because we felt like we needed something that was um more compatible with jazz mouthpieces more mm -hmm. flexible more colorful not quite so centered and focused yeah you know that's that's really um kind of the reason for the s neck and then when working with bob he just needed more yeah you know and so we Push the boundaries a little bit more, yeah, um, and made them made you know made the aperture larger and did a few other things too. Yeah, well, we see we see experimentation, you know, to this day in in all of this in a lot of brands. Experimentation in keywork and in body and neck and bell design and um, the saxophone very much is still a work in progress. You know, in the grand scheme of instruments existing, the saxophone has been around for like this long, yep. you know? And it's, it's nice to see that there's, there's people out there and there's companies and, you know, teams of experts that are sitting down and really trying to like hammer out some of the issues that the saxophone still has. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys seem to be knocking it out of the park and you guys are caring a lot about the design which is which is really nice and you're taking your time and you're only releasing things when they're like good and ready for the world um and that's that's really nice to see um something else that is kind of exciting for you guys and this is a more recent launch for you is the low b flat model uh student model yep. barry sax um where did this all come from? Um, well, um, I played a lot of berry sax uh, growing up. Um, being a bassoonist and doubling uh, meant that I had a lot of book five parts in theater and musicals yeah. and things like that, which means you play bassoon and bass clarinet and berry saxophone. And, you know, I was, the, I was the guy with all the big horns that had a cart to yep. you know, um, and Took you. 30 minutes to load in, right, right. 30 minutes to load out. Yep, yep. Um, and when I was young, uh, there was such a thing as a student model bearing, mm -hmm. right? They existed. 
there was student and pro model berries. Um, and they went to low A sometimes, and they went to low B flat sometimes. And you know, the, the, the low A baritone saxophone um, didn't, it wasn't the first one, right? Saxophones didn't always go to low A. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't even go to B flat in the beginning. Um, and so the low A baritone was um, an invention. You know, my first memory of this was the Mule Quartet, right? And Marcel Mule, uh, Paris Conservatory, and they were playing string quartet transcriptions. Mm -hmm. And the baritone saxophone was playing the cello part. And uh, cellos go down to a low C. Well, on an E-flat instrument, that means you need a low A yeah. to play a concert low C. And so the low A baritone saxophone, uh, you know, was for that purpose. So yeah. that you could play these string quartets, this classical music. But when you look at a lot of jazz players, they still prefer this B-flat configuration, this low B-flat bell. And those went away. And I think the reason they went away was because uh, imports started to be more common. Mm -hmm. And uh, imports from, from Asia were less expensive than American saxophones. And the American companies, you know, at some point they're starting to downsize and then get at exported some point, elsewhere. And the quality of those instruments started to go here and imports well, coming were, in. And... They, were, they were being competitive, right? Yeah. So, you know, at a time when uh, new saxophones were coming from different countries, and were really competing against the American-made saxophones, and they were less expensive, um, that's what people tended to buy. And yeah. when you look at those instruments, those were, uh, you know, reproductions of professional saxophones. When, when a company aspires to make an instrument, they're not going to go buy somebody's student model and evaluate it and reproduce it. Mm -hmm. They're going to go buy a professional model and evaluate it and do their best reproduction of it. Yep. And that's what a lot of these imports were. And there was only low A's. So uh, teachers and institutions and everyone buying baritone saxophones were forced with a, a choice of, do I buy an American-made saxophone or Mexican-made saxophone, you know, mm -hmm. depending on, on where the factory was at that period of time or who owned that American brand at that period of time. Or do I buy this other instrument that comes from Asia that looks to be really well-made and less expensive, but it has a low A. Mm -hmm. And they only had a low A. So most people bought the low A version, and that in turn caused a, a decline in American-made student model saxophones of all kinds, not just baritone saxophones. And then this instrument kind of left us. It went away. Yeah. Nobody really made one for a long time. Um, there wasn't a student-level baritone on the market that I knew of anyway. And yeah. I thought that's an underserved market. So when we decided to do this configuration... The first thing we decided to do was to make it as a 50-second string. Like, we thought, okay, jazz players might really appreciate a horn like this in baritone saxophone made to B-flat. Yeah. You know, made to low B-flat. So that was our was first... This was after the standard 50-second street has already existed. You're thinking, like, an 850 series. Maybe at some point, but just a 50-second street. Okay, even. You know, yeah. like, a 50-second street baritone saxophone with the way we make 50-second streets with the materials that we use, the, the sound concept that we want. Yeah. You know, but just to be flat. Yeah, just yeah. to be flat. And so the idea started with that. Like, let's make a, an instrument, a, a professional baritone saxophone to low B flat as a 52nd Street. Mm -hmm. And then while we're at it, just like we do on all the other lines, let's make a student version too. Yeah. And so this is the student version. Um, and we did release this first because... Uh, professional versions take a long time to, to dial in. And yeah. we're in that process right now. I'm working with a, a, a lovely saxophone player that's giving us great feedback. He's a baritone specialist. And he loves the low B-flat 52nd Street. But we're just finalizing a few changes. Because, yeah. um, like we said earlier, you know, quirks and felts and pads and mechanism, you can adjust to use the same geometry and have it be more efficient and mm -hmm. more affordable. But as we get into that professional one, then we start to get a little pickier about how each key feels and, and yeah. where it's sprung and how long the springs are and, you know, where the cradles are and all of those things. So that's what we're working on now for, for that one. Mm -hmm. And that should be coming out relatively soon, depending on how fast yeah. we can do our work. But this, this is an instrument that I thought was needed because, you know, in my mind, students are not really taller or bigger or stronger than they've ever been. 
and we're giving them these gigantic, heavy instruments to learn on. And just taking the weight out of uh, the low A bell, it's surprising how light that saxophone mm -hmm. is. It's surprising how balanced that saxophone is and how much easier that would be for a person in middle school yeah. to learn baritone saxophone. So I felt like it was really needed. And, and so this instrument is built specifically targeted towards beginning band. Yeah. Like we want good sounding baritone saxophones in beginning band that are not too heavy, yeah. that play in tune, that, that feel great, that can yeah. be balanced on a child's neck and whatnot. And that's, that's some band director's things. It's like, it's not that Barry Sax is hard for a young kid to play. Like the difference in air between an alto saxophone and a Barry saxophone is pretty minimal. Yeah. Um, but it's like... The, the weight yeah. and the size that I think holds some band directors yep. back from having a yep. fourth, yep. fifth, sixth grader right. playing on it. Right. Right. We, we just had someone in yesterday who was looking at kind of like, they were looking at just that next step, Barry Sachs. And I was like, the kid was a little smaller. They were having trouble getting their hands on the saxophone. And I was like, you should try out, you should just hold the Eastman. Like it's relatively new. I haven't had a lot of customers looking at it. It was just yesterday, and she picked it up. She's like, oh, this is, this is like easier to hold. Yeah. She's like, I can get my fingers around all of these keys. And just for that, she was like, I already like this more. And she started playing it, and she was like, and it plays just a little bit easier, too. Yep. Yeah, the weight, I mean, on all instruments, weight is a factor in playability. Yeah. Um, we, we take great pains in our manufacturing to make things as light as possible. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the thing. It's one of the reasons, actually, that we decided to move our, move away from uh, getting our saxophones from Taiwan and build them ourselves. Is because we could tr could control that aspect yeah. of the instrument. Um, but this thing is is uh, an amazing instrument. It turned out better than I ever thought it would. Um, and you know, the idea came, uh, and we thought we want to use as many common parts as possible mm -hmm. to make it efficient, easy to build, those kinds of things. Yep. Um, so. What I did was I took a, a 453 Eastman baritone saxophone, which yep. is our intermediate model, yep. and it goes to low A. And um, my friend Brian Whitaker and I uh, cut the bell. We took a jeweler saw, and it's like a little hacksaw, and we just cut a section out of the bell. Uh, we cut the bell in two places uh, and then um, tuned it. It looked like those camping cups, you know, the expandable things. Yeah, yeah. So yep. it had two hard lines in it. Yep. Um, where we had cut it and soldered it back together. But uh, it turned out really beautifully. So you literally cut the literally low cut, off. cut, yeah. Well, we, we actually cut the B-flat out. Okay. Um, so what, the way we did it was we cut the B-flat out and then moved the A-tone hole down and then cut it above the A and tuned the A. Yeah. Um, is the way we did it. So and it turned out really well. It was just, it was a, it was, you know, just a theory that I had that we could do it that way. And, and match it up to the horn, and it worked out just wonderfully. Mm -hmm. so. That's awesome. Yeah, I think the, the student Barry Sachs uh, market is, you know, a little untapped in there being, you know, really good quality student Barry Saxes. And it's an expensive instrument there for families. There hasn't been a lot of choice. Yeah, there yeah, hasn't been a lot of choice. You know. It's expensive for families to get into, and it's yeah. like, you know, in comparison, like these are, these are affordable saxophones Relatively. and they play well. Uh, I know our trouble is going to be getting band directors on board with low B flat saxophones. And I've been telling people for years, like, I think the, the only people who truly need a low A on their Barry sax are people, the professionals who are like funk players who have to play that half-step pickup. And B-flat is written into a lot of music. And if sure. you're a funk player and you want to do a pickup to B-flat, you need A, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to get that pickup in. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, especially for someone who's picking up a student instrument, yeah. you're probably not at the point where a low A is in your music to begin with. And if you're getting to that point, maybe you should be thinking about stepping up into, sure. you know, a saxophone that that has a low A that is, you know, where you're at in your progression as a saxophone player. Sure. Like, this is more than enough to get you started on Barry Sax. Oh, yeah. You know? The, uh, the unintended consequence of making this instrument and targeting 
towards beginning band is a lot of doublers like it, mm -hmm. a lot of marching bands like it, because now you can march Barry a little bit easier yep. um, because of the balance and the weight issue. Yep. Um, so we had some unintended consequences, which is great because there's a market for uh, more people now that, that desire an instrument like this. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things, like you're saying, it really depends on the literature. Like there is some literature in um, concert band music in high school and, and collegiate level uh, pieces that require low A. Mm -hmm. Like uh, composers know it exists, yep. so they write for it. Yep. And so there is a lot of low A um, written in the literature and even for jazz bands. Yeah. High end, you know, uh, upper level uh, pieces for, uh, for jazz bands. Yeah. Composers write low A's for berries. Um, but in beginning band literature and a lot of uh, older literature, you're not going to see that. So yep. depending on what you're playing uh, or what level you're playing, you, you may or may not need that. But really it was built just you know, to target that beginning band and, and that middle school, junior high level. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hope this, I hope this takes off for you guys. I know, you know in the couple weeks we've had them here, we're putting it in people's hands, yeah. and it's it's been going over well, and it'll be it'll be only a slight uphill battle with band directors, especially the non the non saxophone band directors who right. they went to college and their professors said, when you're looking at Barry saxes, low A. Sure. And it's like, sure. well, let's think, let's back up a little bit, and yeah. you know, when you get to a point where your student needs a low A on their saxophone, a nice part about working. Through companies like Schmidt, it's like, sure. let's trade in yeah. low B flat to that next model. And yeah. through us, it's like, you don't lose any money. And that's kind of a perk of, of working with Schmidt Music. Of course, but, of course. Um, that like, kind of a program, there's no reason not to start here. But, mm -hmm. you know, luckily, people that need that, we also make an intermediate model that has low Exactly. Weight. And we make professional models exactly. that have low so. so, you know, I hope there's other music companies out there, and I know there is, that are making it as easy as possible to move from your student instrument to that next step when you're yeah. ready. Um, and now there's a great student instrument that you guys are able to provide, and that's really awesome. Thank you. Um, as we're kind of getting to the end, maybe uh, one of my last questions is, you know, is there anything we can look forward to from Eastman in the future? Can you give us any, I don't know, anything to look forward sure. to? Well, with the success of the 800 series 52nd Street, we obviously feel like we want to expand beyond just the tenor. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're starting an alto project. Um, and working with Bob Minster was wonderful on the tenor. Mm -hmm. For the alto, we've decided to work with Alex Hahn. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he's going to be playing prototype and giving us feedback the same way Bob did. So that mm -hmm. we can fine tune that alto and and create that uh, eight hundred level fifty second street. We'll come with the Alex Hahn neck. Don't know yet. Okay. Uh, we we have no idea yet. We, we have to go through that process. Yeah. And we have to figure out. It certainly could. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see as we kind of go through the process of creating that instrument. Um, but as far as Eastman saxophones go, beyond that that next model or or whatnot, uh, you know, you'll see things bigger and smaller from us. Mm -hmm. uh, in the future uh, as far as our line. Um, our goal is to create a complete saxophone line mm -hmm. um, and really service anyone who's looking for any kind of saxophone. Um, yeah. So we've only been at this for a few years. I think we've made really wonderful progress uh, in producing saxophones in our own facility. Um, and you know, we've got quite a few things on our, on our to-do list, yeah. but, uh, but all good. And I'm excited for what's coming done such a good job with our altos and our tenors and now our baritones mm -hmm. um, I'm excited to take on sopranos yeah uh, and and more yeah now that's really exciting um, you know before we kind of start wrapping up is there anything else you want to get out there oh I don't know I don't know if there's much more to share yeah than, you know that was a lot <laughs> and you know uh, if you guys uh, enjoyed this or you have some questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments and we'll try and get to um, as many questions as we can. And if there's you know, some stuff that we can reach out to Ryan and his team, we'll definitely do that for you. Um, 
Ryan, thanks for being here and taking some time out of your schedule. Thanks, um, Zach. Yeah, I think the team is looking forward to, I know after this you're going out to some of our other stores and doing some training with our yep. team just on yep. the whole Eastman product line. Yep. Um, and I know they're excited about that. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, uh, Zach. Thanks for sticking around and listening this whole time. Um, I guess we'll catch you in the next one. Thank you.